Hallelujah. As the children are being dismissed, lift your Bibles. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. And while you're finding your place to Ephesians chapter 3, we have a car with your lights on it. It's a Johnson County Tags 194ENK. It's a brown, a brown or maroon Oldsmobile. So if you will, uh, we, don't want, we want you to be able to go home when it's time to go home. So amen. All right. So if you'll check into that, we appreciate that so much. And thanks for the ones who made us aware of that. We're talking today about the church. And you might say, what in the world does the church have to do with Palm Sunday? It has everything to do with Palm Sunday. The promise made to Abraham concerning the coming of the Messiah absolutely included the church. And on Palm Sunday, when the Jews were, were rejoicing and throwing the palms down, welcoming their king, they had, they had little idea, very little idea, that this king who was coming would not only be a king, it was the king, is the king, but he also brought in a new era. The time when the Jew and the Gentile would be one in this new body called the church. And so as they were throwing down the palms and celebrating, even though they didn't know just how great this celebration was, for you and I, it was also our day of celebration as well. Now, let me ask you a question. When we talk about the church, answer this question for me in your mind. Why do we need the church? Now, many of you are thinking, well, my goodness, preacher, that's obvious. And some of you may be saying, well, okay, well, well, of course we need the church. Even in this individualistic society that we live in, we still need to gather, and uh, we need uh, the church for worship. Okay, but I would tell you, I could come back and say to you, well, you know, I can worship in some instances even better on my own or with a few friends. So once again, why do I need the church? And then some of you would say, well, we, we need the church for evangelism. And I would say to you again, evangelism really is done better on a personal basis as you develop relationships with people that you know, whether at work or at school, in your neighborhood, your family. And there are some wonderful organizations out there that, that do evangelism. And sometimes what they do is even more attractive than what is happening at the church. And so... Is evangelism really the reason for the church? You say, well, I've got you now, preacher. Okay, you may be right about that, but I absolutely know I have you now. It's for fellowship. And I would say to you again, if you are able to develop deep relationships and, have, and you can meet together as a group and share your concerns and be accountable to one another, couldn't you do that better than in a larger crowd? So why the church? Well, let's talk about it. First of all, a barrier or a blessing? A barrier or a blessing? What does a church mean to you? Is it a barrier or a blessing? You see, this problem, and especially today it seems, this issue of the importance of the church goes deeper than just the relevance of the church. Because perhaps I'm talking to some of you this morning that you've been wounded by the church. A pastor failed you or a congregation that you attended was divided and the church literally became a battlefield. I remember one of our members years ago, he, uh, uh, he, he shared with me that, that it took him years before he felt comfortable in joining our church because of an experience he'd had in a church before where, where they, they, they were in a battle constantly. He talked about one time how that even in one of the deacons meeting, meetings it broke out into a fist fight. And he said, uh, I'm, I'm a little slow to join a church. And so when he did join our church, it was, it, I was honored that he felt that comfortable to do so. And so some people, because of bad behavior in the church, there's been a barrier ever since. I may be talking to somebody this morning that you were invited to come today, and uh, it really took a lot for you to be here. I want to say to you, thank you and welcome. By the way, let me just take a moment to say thank you to all of our visitors today. You are, you are our guests today. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Now, it's, you ever thought about this? For most of us, we find that it's easier to make a case to convince somebody to commit themselves to Christ than to commit themselves to a church. Why is that? Well, Christ is awesome. Christ is majestic. Christ is compelling. And sometimes the, the church just seems way too human, if you know what I mean. 
and sometimes way too ordinary, and sometimes even a little bit dull. I hope that's not true of us, but it's true sometimes, the churches. Christ is pure, and the church sometimes seems deeply stained, deeply flawed. So it's important this morning. In fact, I've, I've, been, I've been excited about being able to speak on this all week long because we need to awake and realize, even though I feel like God is really blessing our church, we need to awake and realize these are important questions and we need to answer them honestly and we need to be willing to be honest with ourselves. How are we portraying the body of Christ? The church is the body of Christ. We, in other words, when, when we're referred to in the Scriptures as a body of Christ, we are to represent before a lost world Christ. Where you go, Christ goes. What, how our church stands, Christ stands. How our church is perceived in the neighborhood, Christ is perceived in the neighborhood. The Bible tells us that the church is to be the embodiment of truth, and it's also to be the representative of Jesus Christ. So we need to face these questions that I've just presented to you honestly. And guess what? The New Testament does. The apostles weren't afraid to ask, ask these questions. In fact, you know something? Someone who wants to be genuine, somebody who wants to be real, isn't afraid of asking themselves, how am I doing? And the apostles, I want you to realize something. As you read the Bible, here's one thing that one of my professors said this in Bible college, and I found it to be so true. One reason why he said why I know men didn't write the Bible is because men would not say about themselves what the Bible says about them in, the, in, in its pages. If we wrote the Bible, man would be so exalted and glorified. Have you noticed the Scriptures are judgment day honest about us? Here is Christ's own body, the church, and yet he led the apostles to be frank and open and honest about the way the church was, was behaving and was perceived in, the, in the, the early days. You see, the apostles never suggested that churches were, were little colonies of heaven on earth. When you go back and read, you don't see that. The apostles were honest. The New Testament speaks about problems in the church. Go back and read the, the New Testament letters this afternoon when you get home. In 1 Corinthians, we hear about sexual mis misconduct, illegal uh, wranglings in the church, doctrinal errors, division over personalities, and we could go on and on and on. The New Testament's honest, and so we should be honest. You know, there's one thing about it, a person may have problems, but if they'll be honest with somebody, that's the first step to getting the problem solved. Amen? So let's be honest. The church isn't perfect. And so if you're here this morning and you ever had in your mind that the church was perfect, let me just reveal the truth. She's not perfect. This is not heaven on earth. In fact, sometimes the list of, of marks against us is depressing. But the honesty is refreshing. Can you not say that? We can be honest. And that brings us to number two, saints and sinners. You see, the truth is churches are communities of sinners in the process of being restored. Can you say amen to that? Yet, don't forget this as well. Sometimes there are folks in the church who profess to be believers, and they're not. And they're not going to be in heaven. Just because you're standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. <laughs> and just because you're in the church doesn't make you a, a believer. I went to church for a long time and was not a believer. A long time. Saints and sinners. In fact, I will remind you, Judas sat at the communion table with Jesus. Partook of the communion. Think about that. Not saved, not a believer. You see, not everyone who claims Jesus is their Lord will enter the kingdom. So you have to remember that when you're in church as well. That the church is made up of sinners and saints. Sinners that are being made into saints by the power of God. And then there are folks that are just here. And that's fine. Jesus said, let that happen. He said, let the tares preside with the weak. Let God be the one who separates them. That's how we're to do it. 
You see, this is going to be a shock to some people, but on the last day, when God judges everyone, some preachers, some lay leaders, some members of the church will find themselves outside of God's kingdom. So we need to search our hearts and make sure that we are truly born again, truly members of the kingdom of God. Please, I beg you, don't take the chance of one day hearing Christ say, I never knew you. Matthew 7, 23. Now, here's the thing about it. God sees the church's failures, and so does the world. So it doesn't do any good, or it does very little good for you and I to pretend that the problems don't exist. We need to realize it's going to be difficult for unbelieving people to take us seriously if we can't see what is obvious to them. Think about that. And so when you're out talking to folks about the church and, and they say, well, you know, uh, there are hypocrites in the church. Uh, you got problems in the church. The church isn't perfect. You can say, I know. I know, but we love Christ. I know, but we're, we're, we're asking the Spirit of God to make us perfect. We're all journeying. We're all on our way. But yes, don't try to pretend that the church doesn't have problems. The church does have problems. Even the writers of the New Testament were willing to admit that. You see, here's the wonderful thing, though. Alongside of this rigorous honesty that confesses and addresses the sins of the church, the Scriptures also give us a vision of the church that we desperately need to recover. And, beloved, if you've never understood this about the church today, please understand it now. You see, when you and I discover this plan of God for the church, it, it will give us a sense of joy and privilege to belonging to the body of Christ that will cause you to be thrilled to be a member of the family of God. And we need to look at that today. Let's look at number three, God's eternal purpose. Let's look at what that purpose is. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul says, watch this. He says, here's the exact reason God created the church, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God. Would you underline that? The manifold wisdom of God. Manifold. If you've, if you've ever worked on cars, what's a manifold? You know, a manifold is a thing that goes to, it, it, it's got several parts of it. Manifold means many. And the church is to reflect the many-sided, the many-faceted wisdom of God. Did you get that? Wow. Notice this, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the world. Is that what it says? Now, it should be, but that's, but that's not who God's focused themselves upon the church. Who has God got watching the church? To the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. That blows my mind. God has created the church so that he can turn to the angels in heaven and say, see how wise I was in creating the church? Wow. And we'll see in a moment why, why he was so wise in doing that. Notice what it says, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So notice again, God's purpose has always been to display his wisdom to a vast audience in heaven and the way that he's doing that is through the church. Not only does that thrill me, but it overwhelms me. I have a responsibility. The church, we have a responsibility to be able to allow God to say to the angels, was I not wise in creating this thing called the church? You say, but you just said a moment ago, it's full of trouble, it's full of everything else. How in the world does that display God's wisdom? It seems like to me the angels would say, wow, it looks like it was a mistake. Stay tuned. You see, the church, here's something else. The church is not an afterthought tacked on to God's plan toward the end of the Bible story. In other words, God didn't get all the way through the Old Testament, start the New Testament. He's almost into the end of the New Testament and said, oh, wait a minute. It'd be a good idea to have a church. No, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us 
that the church was in the mind of God before he even created the world. We talked about that Wednesday night. Now, has that dawned on you? God had already said there will be a church. He predetermined that a church would exist before he ever even set this blue planet spinning in the atmosphere. God thought of the church first, if you will. Amazing. Amazing. The church was always in the mind and heart of God. And if we want to understand why, the place to begin is in the Garden of Eden of all places. And here's when we begin to see the wisdom of God in the church. Notice this. When God created Eve and brought her to Adam, it was the beginning not just of marriage, but it was also the beginning of something called community and family. Now, as you know, Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, when they chose to know about evil and disobey God, they were not only alienated from God, but they were also alienated from each other. So all of a sudden, this community, this unity was broken. And as we continue to follow the story of the first couple and then the first family, we find that there was anger and resentment that continued to separate the community. Driving people apart. Cain's hatred toward God was reflected in his hatred toward his brother that led to the world's first murder. And eventually, listen, Cain separated himself from his family and went and built a city. And did you notice something? Go back and read the account of Cain and his city, and you'll notice that one of the first things he did was build walls. Do you see where we're going here? We're not very far along in human history until we're already building walls to keep people out. In Cain's case, he was concerned that a branch of his family might still be upset about the fact that he murdered Abel and they might come looking for him, so he built walls. And so we have, we went from a unit of a man and a wife to a family to the deterioration of that unity, the destruction of that unity. And now we're even building walls. We're alienating ourselves even more. Think about that. And as generations passed, a fractured family gave birth to a divided community. And before long, you have all kinds of divided communities. And then violence begins to fill the whole world. And you'll remember what happened then. Because of all the violence, because of this lack, listen, this lack of the ability to be unified, and this hatred and resentment that kept growing in people across the world, God had to send a flood to end it. He even said that the hatred was so terrible that if man had been left alone, they would have all wiped themselves out. We're doing a pretty good job of working toward that right now. Just a couple of buttons pushed could end the whole thing. Isn't it amazing how we're just bent on that? Bent on being alienated from each other? Impossible. The world, listen, the world keeps working for unity. You keep hearing about this, but it, man can't do it. You ever noticed? He can't do it. As cute communities emerged and grievances multiplied, again, men, many felt the need for some kind of security. You see, here, here's the thing. After... The flood, Noah arrives on dry land, and he has a golden opportunity. God says to him, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to take you from the time of consciousness to, to following your consciousness. I'm going to give you a little bit of government here. I'm going to give you a few rules to go by, and surely uh, you guys can figure out how to work it out. Noah hadn't been out of the ark hardly any time at all before he is drunk. And all of a sudden, the alienation between the brothers begins, and he and his own son began. And then, and then he had told them to go, listen, in unity and populate the entire world, but do it unified. But no, what did they do? No, once again, the violence begins again, and men this time are saying, hey, we don't want to re repeat last time, so this time we need to have some built-in security. And here's what's weird. 
At this juncture in history, they say, we don't trust God anymore. We don't want God in our lives anymore. So they alienated themselves from God. But here's what they said. We're going to alienate ourselves from God, but we're going to come together as a unit. And so they went to a place called Babel, and they began to build a huge society with towers so they could watch out for anybody that would dare come against them. And they were, listen, they were going to do this themselves. They were smarter than God. God came down and came among men, caused the languages to be to where they couldn't understand each other. And here they go, once again, alienating themselves from each other. Now, God had meant for them to go into the world and populate it, but he meant for them to do it in unity. But now they're saying, no, no, I don't like the way you talk. I don't like the way you live. And so I'm going over here, and I'm going to have my own language, my own culture. And they begin to alienate themselves again. We're told about that in Genesis 11, 3 and 4. But don't ever forget this. At the heart of this project that they were attempting in Babel was a deep rebellion against God. They wanted to make a name for themselves. And God had to confuse their languages because what they were trying to attempt would be impossible without his involvement. And, and always remember that. Right now, all over the world, people are trying to be unified, trying to come together as one, but they're leaving God out. It's impossible. And so little clusters that shared the same language spread across the face of the earth and developed different cultures and became increasingly isolated. You see, sin has separated us from God and from each other. Now, the truth is, in fact, you, you can pick up any history book you want to when you get home and just start reading it. Ancient history just began, and you'll see that history is really the story of our alienation from God and each other, from the true God and each other. That's what history is. And throughout the course of history, God has been advancing the plan, a plan rather, in which to reconcile many to himself and to each other to bring back the unity to himself between man and himself and man and each other. And so here we have it. As we go back in the Bible, it began with God coming to a fellow by the name of Abraham. He said, I'm going to bless you. And notice what he went on to say. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. And when you begin to follow the story of Abraham's descendants all the way through the Old Testament, you can see God's working in Abraham's life, but it's still not clear how God's blessing on them was the means of blessing to all nations, but it will be in just a moment. You see, there was a mystery. There was always a mystery because you saw Abraham and you saw that the nation of Israel being raised up, but if you had been one to think about this and be concerned, you're going, well, how is he going to bless all nations? Now, it's amazing, but even the Jews today think that they've got the right idea. They've taken a statement that was made in the Old Testament about the temple, and they believe that it's all centered in the temple. And they think that unity can't come until the temple's rebuilt. There was a statement by one prophet that said that all the nations would be blessed in the temple of God. That's why there's such a move, one of the reasons why there's such a move to rebuild the temple in Israel. They honestly believe that once it's rebuilt, unity will come. And guess what? It will. But it's a false unity. The Bible says, for when they say peace, peace, then sudden destruction comes upon them. And that Christ will allow the temple to be built. They will think that all of a sudden the world is, is moving in their direction. This is what God meant to Abraham. The whole world is going to be blessed. Yay! And then it's all destroyed. Three and a half years into it, Antichrist breaks the covenant, and the violence breaks out again. And the alienation is worse than ever. And here we go. It's because they don't understand the mystery. You see, there was a mystery about this that would only be revealed when God sent his son, Jesus Christ. And because Israel rejected the son, they don't understand the mystery. Ephesians 3, 4 through 6 says this, 
the mystery of Christ, notice this, which in other age, ages was not made known to the sons of men. God knew about it. God already planned it, but it wasn't made known to the sons of men. As it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Jesus Christ, by his death, resurrection, and ascension would bring about the unity. Finally, genuine unity, real unity among men. Now, it's no, it should not take you by surprise that when he came into the world, our Lord Jesus Christ, he was born to the line of Abraham. And he came to the Jews first, but even he also brought the good news of God's grace to the Gentiles. If you're reading through the book of Matthew, you'll notice something. After chapter 13, he stops appealing to the Jews, starts going to the Gentiles. And after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. And on that day, this agent of unity was born, called the church. It was established. And on Pentecost, I love how God does his planning. There were representatives, Jewish representatives from every known nation under heaven in Jerusalem on that day. The whole world, somebody from all around the world, was gathered there. And so when the Spirit was poured out and the church first began, there were converts from all over the world. And the unity that God had always intended began. The agent that would bring the world together began. And the angels, when they saw this on the day of Pentecost, you know they had to rejoice. Think about that. Now, this was so significant that all these people were here that Luke makes sure that he lists some of the nationalities. People from Egypt and Libya, which would represent all the African people. Asians and Arabs. And then the Europeans were represented by Rome. God had gathered representatives from all over the known world. Think about that. Groups that had been scattered, listen to this, groups that had been scattered at Babel now gathered in Jerusalem. It's the reversal of Babel. You know why? Because Babel was centered on man. Pentecost was centered on Christ. God poured out his Holy Spirit, and on that day, 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus Christ, Acts 2, 41. God was beginning this new creation. He was drawing people from all over the world to faith in Christ and gathering them into a new community called the church, which from the very first day crossed, listen, and this is what's so important, from the very first day, the church crossed the barriers of race, language, and culture. Now, throughout history, throughout the history of the world, as I said a moment ago, man has tried to achieve this on his own. There are still meetings going on today attempting to bring everyone together in the world. But they never succeed, and they never will succeed. However, God is bringing together people from every culture, every generation, making them one. In Jesus Christ. Jew and Arab. Remember on the Wednesday nights when we watched the films from Kamal Salim, how that Iranians are being saved by the thousands right now? Becoming sisters and brothers of ours through Christ. Jew and Arab, black and white, young and old, rich and poor. They were all there on the day of Pentecost. And as they came to faith in Jesus Christ, God brought them together in a brand new community. Distinctions of race and color and gender and education and economic status are rendered unnecessary when men and women from every background come to see that their one way of being right with God is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we have in common with every single believer across the world, no matter where they are.
bowing before him, we discover a profound unity with each other that transcends everything that makes us different. Isn't it a blessing when you're out somewhere? You know when you see a brother or sister in Christ? The walls are down. It doesn't matter. You have Jesus in common. In God's new community, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. And the Holy Spirit baptizes us, or in other words, brings us together, all who believe in the one body. 1 Corinthians 12.13 says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. We all have the same Spirit. You know, when you're out somewhere and you're talking with somebody that is not a Christian, you, very often you don't know what spirit they have. Is it a spirit of this? Is it a spirit of that? But you always know when you're talking to a Christian that you're unified in that one intent, and that is to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me, let's, get, let's get specific. God brings us together in Jesus. He makes us one as he reconciles us to himself. So let's get specific about this. I'm an American and proud of it. Hope you are too. But listen, I have more in common with a Russian who loves Christ than an American who does not. Come on. Amen. Amen. Think about this. A Christian professor of astrophysics will have more in common with an illiterate believer than a fellow academic who does not know Christ. Amen? It's Christ who brings us together. This is what Paul was talking about when he says that God is putting his wisdom on display for the vast audience of heaven through the church. Once again, think about these angels who all these thousands of years have watched men and women who've seen humankind on earth, and it's just one violent act after another, one act of alienation after another, one attempt to keep, from being, keep yourself separate from somebody else, and then all of a sudden, and, and the angels have seen gender, race, all these things dividing, and now all of a sudden they look at the church and they're saying, wow, in the church it doesn't matter. Father, that's wise. That's wisdom. In the church it doesn't matter. Now here's what's sad is when the church doesn't reflect that. Oh, I tell you, it's such a blessing to me as your pastor. I've told you this a hundred times that I never, get, I never get tired of saying. It blesses my heart that I walk in here on every Sunday morning, and there are folks black and white. There are folks rich and poor. There are, I love to, to think of the fact that in some of our Sunday school classes, the executive is sitting right there with the farmer. Amen. 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 Oh, and I love this. The farmer's teaching him. <laughs> Don't you love it? I grew up in a church like that. It blessed my heart. When I was uh, up to the third grade, I went to a certain church, and I remember, I don't remember much about it. I just remember I didn't want to go there much. I remember coming home and just, you know, I, I had been bored to tears. And I, and I, and, and there were just all kinds of problems in church. And then all of a sudden, somebody came to visit my dad one night, my mom. And they said, you've got to come to Southland Baptist Temple. They said, you wouldn't believe it. Man, you walk into there and there's wheelchairs all the way down the aisles. There, there, there are different races. There are people, you'll see one guy across the aisle with his, with his bibbed overalls on. He's got his best white shirt, but he's got his bibbed overalls on. Then you'll see a guy in a Botany 500 suit. And it's young and old and everybody's excited. My dad said, well, we'll check that out. We never went to another church. Every Sunday was exciting as I sat there and I was taught so well in my spirit, even though I didn't get saved until I was 20, I was taught so well in my spirit, this is the way it ought to be. Black and white and rich and poor and executives and farmers and, and no one is over the other. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. 
And that's what kept me going. Oh, it wasn't perfect. You say, did you ever get hurt in the church? I got more than hurt. The Sunday school superintendent spanked me. I got hurt two ways. You know, I saw him years later, and I said, you spanked me, you rascal. And, you know, and he, he knew I was a pastor and followed my ministry. And he said, no, I didn't. And I said, oh, I'm glad you forgot it, but you spanked me. Listen, the church brings everybody together. And that brings us to number four, unity and diversity on Sunday morning. Let's take this down to the level of the local church gathering for worship. Now, there's little doubt that like attracts like. And so the easiest way to grow a large church is to find out uh, who is just like you and bring everybody that's just like you into the church. And you'll grow pretty fast, they say. But that, obs that obscures <laughs> one of God's greatest purposes for the church. Yes, it's the purpose of the church to evangelize. Yes, it's the purpose of the church to worship. Yes, it's the purpose of the church to provide fellowship. But the main purpose of the church is to bring all people from all over the world, different backgrounds, into one place and have diversity and yet unity. That only God can do. Only God can do. Now, the problem with attracting just the folks that are like you is that while you may succeed in, attract, in attracting a lot of people, it obscures this great purpose of God in the church, which is to bring people from totally different backgrounds together so that they may discover and not only discover but demonstrate that despite all their differences, they're truly one in Jesus Christ. God is glorified by unity across diversity, as I said. Now, there's nothing surprising to the world about a narrow band of people who are all alike gathering together for worship because they like the same kind of music and because they, they are at ease with each other socially. But forgive me, the world probably gets a little bit suspicious that this is nothing but a glorified religious country club. Oh, no. It's when the world sees people coming together across great divides of generation, race, class, and education to worship and serve Christ, then the world will sit up and take notice. Because only God can do that. That brings us to number five. Imperfect, but loved. And this is what I want all of you here today to get above everything else. Look at Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might, notice, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. That's why the preaching is central to everything. Amen? Preaching is central to everything. Washing of the water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, she should be holy and without blemish. I said it a moment ago. Let me say it again. The church is a community of sinners in the process of recovery. But our destiny is glorious. We're not perfect now, but we're going to be. And so, it would be really wise of all of us to be careful how we speak of someone who's loved that much by Christ. Have you been criticizing the church lately? You've been talking down about the church, moaning about the church, whining about the church? Be careful. There was a pastor one time that went to a wedding, and, and the photographer at this particular wedding was used to, he, he had been used to weddings that only lasted about 15 minutes. I don't think I've ever seen one like that, but anyway. My part's usually about 15 minutes, but that's only one part. Anyway, as the wedding is going on, this uh, pastor is waxing eloquent. He's just going on and on and on. And the pastor's wife, who had two little tiny boys, they had to go to the restroom, so she's taken to the rest, restroom. When she comes out, he hears her the photographer say uh, something to his assistant and then he turns to her and says do you know who that 
guy is in there going on and on and on? And she said, yeah, I do. I love him a lot. He's my husband. You ought to be careful how you speak about somebody who's really loved. You see, the Bible says that Jesus Christ loved the church so much, he gave himself for her. Did you know Christ came to die on the cross not only for the whole world, but especially for the church? Hmm. I want you to think about that. Those who criticize the church may find themselves, just like this photographer, horribly embarrassed when they stand in God's presence and discover how much he loves her. So I would adjure you today, instead of being an agent of criticism, I want to encourage you to be an agent of change. Instead of making excuses for your absence, why don't you make effort to help improve the church that you attend faithfully? And when you and I realize how much Christ loves the church, it, once we really realize that, we'll love her too. Blemishes and all, we'll love her too. And when you know Christ gave himself for the church, you'll look for ways to give yourself for the church too. I went to a preacher's meeting in Tennessee one time when, when I pastored in Nashville. My good friend Al Henson was speaking at this one. And I'll never forget he got up that day and he said, I'm speaking today of sheep. And I'm going to talk about sheep. And he gave some definitions of what a sheep is according to Scripture and how God sees sheep and so forth. Sheeps, and sheep are the members of the church and so on. And then he began to weep. If you know Al... That comes easy for him. He carries a burden all the time. I love him. And he looked at us preachers and he said, I'm going to call on many of you today to quit. <laughs> We're, all right, I came here for encouragement. Thank you, I appreciate that so much. He said, I'm dead serious. He said, I'm, gonna, I'm calling on many of you today to quit unless you can look at me and say, I love the sheep. Do you love the sheep? He had talked about unruly sheep. He had talked about unattractive sheep. He had talked about, you know, antagonistic sheep. He talked about the mess sheep make. He said, but Jesus loves the sheep. He's the great shepherd, and Peter says, you're the under shepherd. If you're going to pastor a church, you've got to love sheep. You've got to love them just the way they are. And I'm going to say to you as sheep, do you love the church? Do you love her just the way she is? Does your heart break to see her better? Are you going to make every attempt to make her better? Think about it. Or will you just complain and criticize and be absent? You see, salvation from sin listen, also involves being reconciled to each other. You're saved from sin, but you're saved to something else. You know what? You're, you're saved from sin to do what? To be reconciled to God and each other. You, listen, we start out today, why do we need the church? Because it's as I come together in a large group like this, or a small group if the church is small, but as I put myself in a place to where I make myself accountable to somebody else, to where they care if I'm not there, to where they care if they see me going astray, to where they give a rip if I'm, I'm, they see me drifting from the things of God. When I do that, you can't get that on television. You can't get that on the Internet. You can't get that anywhere else but in the assembly of God's church. And that's what we need. Can you imagine what the average Christian life would be like if we didn't have to be accountable to somebody else? You know, I'm a pastor, and in our times, I'll be honest with you, that I get a little weary living in a fishbowl. I, I live in a fishbowl. You know, if, 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 in fact, I am the friendliest guy in Leavenworth County. I know I am. 
You say, how do you know you are? Because I'm so afraid that one of you lives out there that I'm, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I don't recognize all of your faces, so when I'm in the grocery store, hey, hey, hey. And some people look at me like, back up, buddy, gosh. You don't even know me. <laughs> but I'm like, I know, but I might. I don't want to offend you. <laughs> Listen, we need to care. When this service is over today, I'm giving you homework, and you can do it right now. Your first assignment is to find somebody when this service is over that you either don't, excuse me, don't know or are not sure you know or not, and go introduce yourself. And for those of you who get this, I've been going here five years, why didn't you know me? Please be kind. My mother one time in, in our home church, we'd gone there forever. And they started a campaign of, of being way more friendly. And somebody came to her and said, I've never met you. Are, are you new? And my mother said, I've gone there 35 years. And I said, shame on you, Mom. Good night. I said, number one, you and Dad sit under the balcony back there so far that people would have to get a, 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 a semi-truck to find you. And she laughed and said, you're right. Go to somebody Listen, we love to cluster together with those we know, but you don't know somebody may have come here today that this is their last stop before they check out. But if you just extended a hand and said, I recognize you, you're not just a face in the crowd, you really do matter to me, you might just stop that from happening. Amen. Amen. Becky and I had just gotten saved. I'd grown up in this church but we, we wanted to get involved in the junior high ministry. We went to the junior high party one night, and I couldn't believe it. We're standing there, and, and we're wanting to get hooked up and involved. And after all the refreshments had been served and the speeches had been made, we're standing back there expecting, you know, I grew up in this church. They just heard me give my testimony on a Wednesday night. And they're, they're clustered with each other. I turned to Becky and I said, I'll give it five more minutes and we're gone. And I said, I hate to think of this, but the church I grew up in, I hate to think I need to go somewhere else to serve him, but we give it five minutes. All of a sudden, we see this couple. The lady's name was Bobby. I don't remember the husband's name, but anyway, they, they came over. And they befriended us. And from that moment on, every time they saw us, whether in church or in that class or whatever, they were there. They don't know how close we came to finding another ministry. It's good that you welcome those that you already know. But please make sure at least every Sunday you find one that you don't know. And be the, let's be the friendliest place in this city. And you know what? If you happen to be out like me in the grocery store, and you say, that might be a church member. Hey, and they say, do you know me? Did you go to my church? No. Well, you should. <laughs> Amen? Take advantage of a mistake. Amen? You should. Well, you, then you say, well, most of the city goes anyway. I thought you were there, but anyway. <laughs> Listen, remember how we started out? Why did God create the church? even though it should be a place of fellowship, evangelism, and worship. God wants to talk around, walk, walk, turn around to the angels and say, was I wise or not? Was the church a good idea or not? And you know what the angels say? I love it. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You know what holy means? It means you're perfect. It means you're perfect in your essence. You're perfect in everything you do, and you're perfect in everything you plan. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, I know the church has got blemishes and, and marks and spots, but it's still the best thing in the world. It's still the best thing going. Let's make it the best thing in Wyandotte County. Amen. Now, 
church is the bride of Christ. Christ loves her. He's given himself for her. And he will bring her to his home and share his love, life with her forever. So today, if you're tempted to complain, rem remind yourself of this. It's actually an awesome privilege to belong to the body of Christ. In fact, there was even somebody who said that one time. Can anybody tell me who it was? If you shout it out, I'll give you a book. John the Baptist. When they said, are you he? Are you the one? Are you the Messiah? He said, no. He said, I am only a friend of the bridegroom. He said, I'm of the covenant of the Old Testament. We're friends. But he said, a bride's coming. And Christ is the bridegroom. I'm just a friend. You and I are that bride that John had wished he could be a part of. Wow. Let's pray. Father.